Hello and welcome to tonight's show. So 165 of On The Bench, the podcast for scale modelers, by scale modelers, all about scale models. And this show is being brought to you by our latest Patreon supporters. So a huge thank you to Mark Grant, Eddie Compton, and special mention to Paul Pendleton-Brown for your ongoing and new contributions to the show. You too can help support the show. Simply go to www.patreon.com forward slash on the bench and pledge any amount from as little as one dollar per month upwards and of course each new patreon supporter gets an on the bench sticker we greatly appreciate all the support from our patreon supporters and just helps us with our production and hosting costs And hello, welcome to the show, and in the studio I've got Ian. G'day Dave, g'day Julian, and g'day listeners. And of course Julian. Good morning. How are we all, gentlemen? Good. Very early. It's too <laughs> early. Yeah, it's way too early. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately we had to get in a little bit earlier because we've got a fantastic interview coming up with uh, John Spud Murphy. Yes, of, um, looking forward to that. He does some fantastic armour modelling mm. and uh, very keen to have a listen to what he's got to say. But then, um, before we get to that, we've got a whole heap of other stuff to chew through. We've got um, quite a big mailbag. And, of course, the Falcon's written in with all the new stuff that's coming out. Ooh. But before we even get to that, what have you guys been up to? Uh, not much. <laughs> no, not much? <laughs> to be honest, not much at all. Huh, Julian? Um, working on the Leopard 2 that yes. I'm doing. Uh. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, so... Um, I threw my uh, um, MAK Falca in the bin. Oh, what? So what here's, here's what happened, right? What happened, Julian? I was like, I was painting it, and I, I painted a, a fairly nice um, freehand wavy demarcation mm-hmm. between the top and the bottom. Yep. And I thought, well, you know, because the paint I was using was from a rattle can that had been decanted. Right, yes. Right? I thought, well, I've still got the rattle can. It's still not empty. I can use that across the top of it because this thing's huge, right? Mm-hmm. I can, I can just use this stuff across the top of it. What's the point in decanting a lot of it just to spray it on with an airbrush when I can just spray can this stuff on? Yes, yes. So I went to did to do that. And it was it looked like, you know, like any other time I'd spray sprayed something. Mm-hmm. And then all of the paint retreated from across the model and pulled in the middle of it. Oh, jeez, dude. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. So there's just no paint adhesion mm. at all? Yeah. It was like oil on a... On, on a tile. On a glossy tile. Something like that, yeah. It, it kind of did that thing. Hmm. And I've talked to people and they're like, oh, maybe it was too cold. And you know, maybe it was too cold, but... Maybe I mean, our, 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 our idea of cold isn't that cold and it was a sunny day. Yeah, that's no, definitely um, an incompatibility inca- issue. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, where it had actually, you know, removed itself from across the mall, those areas were fine. I could probably have just painted over it. But the problem is it pulled in one part and filled up all the panel lines and everything. I was like, nah, this thing's stuffed. <laughs> oh, no. jeez. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> all that work. So yeah. What's, so what's next? I don't know. I got to find uh, something to contribute, don't I, mm. for this uh, display? I got some sci-fi things there that I can. Well, you've got seven days. Yeah. Well, less than seven days. Uh, I've still got. Days. I've still got like that uh, that Warhammer thing that I bought, and but it it's been sitting on on my bench for a long time, and then you know, like all the dust and stuff has descended upon it, so it's all like I blew the dust off, and it's still looking hairy. So I was like, uh, what am I going to do? <laughs> wash it. Yeah, I'm going to have to wash it. Yep. Aren't I? Soft uh, brush, warm, lukewarm soapy water. And, of course, what Julian's alluding to is Model Expo 2023, which, as we record, is only seven days away. Not less than that. Um, it starts on Friday, June 16th, and open at 9am, closes at 5pm, and again on Saturday the 17th and Sunday the 18th. 
Um, Except 18th, it starts at 9.30. Correct. And goes till 4. Admission, $15 for adults, $10 for children, $10 for concession or families, $30. Model entry, $5 for the first model, 3 bucks for each additional one. Um, Venue and directions, Um, it is at the Sandown Racecourse, enter from Princess Highway. Uh, For those of you who know live in Melbourne and uh, live in Australia, Melway Map Reference 80, uh, Map 80 Reference C10. No one, let's go, no one uses Melway Let's anymore. go back to the 1980s, <laughs> man. Melway's Map References. I still carry Melway Maps just in case. Really? Oh, I've Don't still know. got my old one in my yeah. car. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not buying any new ones. Yeah. No, nah, stuff that. So Model Expo uh, 2023, obviously, is the big one for us. Um, we probably won't be recording because no. uh, apparently there's a lot of space taken up there mm-hmm. and there's no room for us this year. That's fine. It gives us a chance to actually enjoy the show for a change mm. rather than having to sort of sit down and record. But um, That's true. We'll still be catching up with everybody, all our good mates and everything, everything there. So either be there or be square. So it's looking like a really big one for this year. And, of course, we'll be reporting on it um, on our next show. So looking forward to that. Um while I am talking about modelling events, uh, Scott Collingwood wrote in and said, Hi, lads. Very much enjoying the show. Heard your most recent podcast of roundup of events for the rest of the year and wondered if you might like to add a couple that are in far north Queensland. Well, of course you would, Scott. Firstly, there's going to be the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum Armour, uh, Ost Armour Fest, yeah, military model competition that runs on the 25th to the 27th of August. Uh, if you want to find out more details about that, go to the Cairns Scale Modelers Facebook page for details. And then there is a Townsville and District Scale Modelers Expo on the 9th and 10th of September at the Oasis Centre in Townsville. Uh, for more information on that, have a look on Facebook for the Townsville and District Scale Modelling Group. Both events are, of course, open to entries from all over the countries. And that is from Scott Collingwood from the Cairns Scale Modelers. Yeah, we really got to get down to that um, Oz Army. Oh, we do, we do. Because I I watch them every Wednesday when they drop their videos. And the latest ones, uh, they're doing like a three-parter series Mm because they've uh, gone for a road trip down to Shepparton. In Australia, in Victoria. And met this guy who owns a um, earth-moving construction company. Yeah. Whose dad was an avid collector of tanks. Oh, and, I, I, I actually that came in, into my feed for yeah, whatever reason. And they've just recently scored themselves three grants. Wow! With all the Aussie options, including um, anti-grenade mesh, the frontal armor, and the it's like an Aladdin's cave for them there. And like oh. these things have been sitting there in this guy's yard since the '80s. So there's like pine trees growing through the engine decks, and <laughs> and you're watching them having to cut the pine trees and use the big bulldozers and. And they had one there which still the track's on. And yeah. they went, oh, we, it's been sitting here for 60, 40-odd years, if yeah. not longer. And they pull, they go to pull it out and everything's just smoothing, turning wow. smooth as silk. Wow. Absolutely smooth as silk. I'm like, these guys. And they've still got the original armour markings on them. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, We've yeah, definitely yeah. got to get up to that museum. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, well, that was our first ever interview, wasn't it? Uh, it was the first 10, yeah. yeah so here's the question. Do we go when they have Armour Fest on or do we go of when course. they have yeah, the way you get to, oh, unless they're gonna, we go when they they we tee up with them, they give us a ride in a tank anyway. But <laughs> I think you, you want to go for a ride. That. You got to you got to go for a ride in a tank when you get there. Yeah, we're gonna have to look at that. Yeah, mm. very closely. Yeah, mm. it's one place I really want to get to. Too many places to go. So many things to see. Yes. Oh, there is, there is. Totally agree. We're being pulled in all directions <laughs> these days, aren't we? <laughs> All right, let's hear from one of our sponsors, and we're back with uh, Mailbag. Back very shortly. Hi, I'm Scott, the creator and owner of the Scale Modeler Supply, Australia's largest manufacturer of hobby paints. Our premium airbrush ready acrylic lacquer paints are designed specifically for use on plastics with a comprehensive range covering all popular modeling subjects including military, aircraft, rail, auto, sci-fi and more. And not only that, but we also have a wide selection of essential hobby tools and now Infinite Colour, our new range of water-based paints for miniatures. So to check out our range and to find your closest retailer, please visit our website at scalemodeler.com.au. So when quality matters, choose SMS Paints. 
All right, let's have a look at what's in the mailbag. And the first person to write in is Matt Waterman, who writes, Hi guys, love the podcast. I listen to it on my way to and from work. I've attached some pictures of my latest build. It's the Australian Army Abrams with a bunch of accessories that I 3D printed. Ooh. So he's got some wonderful pictures there some of nice tight his... Work there, yeah. Yeah, um, of all the gear that he's sort of thrown on the back and <laughs> milk the milk crate <laughs> yeah that looks good and um if you're listening to us um by all means go to our other facebook page which is on your bench matt and uh, feel free to yeah throw some pictures on so everyone can see it and i'd love to know some more about um your 3d accessories so uh, please drop us another email and uh so we can perhaps chat in more detail about mm. that because some of your 3D printing work there looks absolutely sensational. Yes. So I'd love to hear more about that. Um, Ray Davis writes out, uh, writes in, uh, hi there, Davey and Julian. I uh, hope that you're all doing well and really hope that Julian has gotten over his jet lag. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank both you and Dave and Darren for allowing me to join in with the visits to Albatross and Haas Museum and then be part of the podcast episode. To say I was nervous would be an understatement. Nevertheless, I had a great day in keeping this email short. Just wanted to send a shout-out of thanks and appreciation to one of your listeners, which is Damien Rigby. <laughs> yes. He heard me talking about trying to source a Marson mat or perforated steel planking, PSP, for my uh, Meteor build. And reached out to me and then was generous in mailing me a spare base that he had to say that I was humbled was an understatement as well. It never ceases to amaze me that there are kind and generous people out there still. Anyway, take care and I hope to catch up with you guys, including Julian, at Scale ACT 23 in Canberra. Kindest regards, the kook north of the border. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely, Ray. You when, coming with us, Julian? When is it? It's, it's November. Isn't November. It? No, the weekend after uh, Cup Weekend, Melbourne okay, Cup. Okay, that's, that's that's far enough away that I don't have to think about it for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to start thinking about booking accommodation and stuff. So, yes. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. And then you got to figure out how you're going to get up there because um, Ed and I are too full in our car. Mm. Oh, there's a whole heap going. I might there? have to hire a car this year. Hire a bus, minivan. No. Be, who want, yeah, who wants to drive? Tell on wheels driving up in a bus. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Um, next email comes from Craig Everson, uh, Aussie Scale Models. Um, hi, Davey and Julian. Hope you're all keeping well. Started listening to the latest episode and the talk about 135th planes, namely the border model kits. My take on this is that I know it's not for everyone, but I think it's good for the 135th armour builders as it gives them a little more options for doing dioramas or vignettes i know there is a lot more options than 48 with all the 48 scale vehicles that are out there now but if you don't build that scale this is the next best thing and if you have fat fingers like i do the bigger scale is so much easier to build kind regards craig everson of aussie scale models thanks for that mate um, Frank Blanton writes in this morning. I have on my Spotify episode 154 of On the Bench enjoying a cup of char and the lovely Tamiya 135th scale Valentine tank doing a bit of washes and weathering. I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Miller, especially when he discusses mission model paints. I switched to that paint line exclusively in 2017 and I get fantastic results with mission model paints and primers. Thanks for all the great podcasts that are available to listen to whilst on the bench. Be well. That's Frank Blanton from RVA Scale Model Studio in Richmond, Virginia, USA. Yeah. And he actually sent us a picture of his bench, which looks nice and messy, which I'm glad because mine is You've too. You've got to have a messy bench. Well, some people try um, to have a build with clean benches. Yeah, they do that. <laughs> Um, Mark Grant writes in, I've been listening to your podcast for the last few months. I enjoy you, Ian and Julian's hum humour and outlook on the hobby. I've started listening to your early podcasts as well. Oh, good luck. And I'm enjoying them, including the first 10 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get as much time as I'd like to model uh, at the moment, but hopefully one day soon. 
I listen mainly while I'm driving. I started listening to the Sprue Cutters Union when they started. That's where I heard them talking about your podcast and listened to the episode uh, that um, on your pod where you had Chris and Will on, decided to listen to some more and really enjoyed it. Even if you don't get much time to model, I find listening keeps your interests keeps you interested and ready to try any tips you've picked up while listening. Again, thanks for the entertainment. I've still got loads to catch up on as I'm running up to episode 33. Ooh, yep. <laughs> and that is Mark Grant from Essex in the United Kingdom. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Very brave listening to the first 10 episodes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Paul Pendleton Brown Good morning all I trust that you're all well And not stuffed from Dave's brekkie <laughs> <laughs> It was a good breakfast In the latest episode of OTB You read out a correction Regarding the Ford fuselage of the Meteor Being made of aluminium and not wood This is correct But Ooh. <laughs> Due to the complex curves required for the jet intakes Being difficult and time consuming At the time it was designed during wartime the first four inches of the intake rings are, in fact, laminated ply and not metal. Uh. Having seen some images of metal chipping on the intakes of some meat box models, bear in mind it is wood covered in fabric, which is then doped so it would not chip back to aluminium. Gloucester's continued with different intake materials, and on the Javelin, the intakes were made of rolled steel. The Gloucester Design Office was worried about compressibility issues and pressures on the intakes due to Javelin's much higher speed, hence the use of another material other than aluminium. Hope you and the listeners find the above interesting. All the best from Liverpool in the motherland. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That was uh, very good information. See, very this is one of those too. things yeah. where, um, yeah, as always, like the more you drill into into the historical details, the more it diverges instead of converging yeah, to a single answer. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much knowledge out there as well, which is great to be able to tap into. Yes, yes. Totally agree. Uh, Quentin Franchetto writes in, G'day Benches. <coughs> Sorry if this one's a bit of a ramble. So after a while of avoiding them, I've decided to try my hand at a model ship. Hey. Well done. This came about after a week or two of getting back in the world of warships. Wouldn't help much. No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, ordered a kit, and when it arrived, I opened the box to find one of the photo etched frets were kind of bent. Ooh. It spent the last 16 or so hours between a few hardcover books with no real change. I don't suppose you guys have any tips on the how to flatten them out. Thanks in advance, Quinton. Uh, um, show us the pictures, Dave. Right there. There's the pictures there. Yes, the look. Oh, They're not yeah. too bad, actually. That's, it's not creased. No. So you, you're lucky. I'd probably anneal it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then get a something flat roller and just roll it. So when you say anneal, for those who don't Heat know what up. we're talking about. Heat it up till it gets like a, a cherry colour. Mm-hmm. Not too much because it'll melt. No, but heat not, it up. So uh, Really cherry? Yeah, yeah. You get it nice and hot. And then flip it up, so you got your, your, your bow facing the top. Yep. Get an old kitchen roller mm. and just roll it. And what you'll find is it'll start, after a while, it'll start to bend the other way. Then just flip it over again and just give it another thing. And that'll get it nice and flat again. He's lucky he's got no creases. If you've got creases, then you start having real major issues trying to get creases out. And annealing photo which <laughs> is something that you should be doing anyway because um, photo which because it's brass, it's quite springy. And mm. you want to take that spring out Correct. when you're actually – like, for example, if you're doing a, a radar or something like that mm. or if you're trying to do a uh, right angles, the yes. material naturally wants to sort of spring back. By annealing it, you're um, – you're, you're, you're removing that springiness mm, and you make the it a bit softer too so it's easier to handle I mean, I'd and be scared bend. to get it up to a red oh no I've gotten them it, and it, does, it doesn't take much to sort of get to that, no, they, to that they, red they heat stage. really quick yeah. in but fact yeah. you've got to be you got to be careful that you don't overheat yeah. it yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I was going to say I mean that's what I'd be careful yeah. of I, I've, I've, I've you don't want to do it too long because you'll melt it you've got you to get it nice and hot so it's got a bit of glow to it really yep Mm. I only ever just heat it until it like changes in like visibly changes in color. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can see it sort of see the heat go mm. through it, and yeah. then you can see it sort of just dull off. Yes, right. That's what I yep. get it to. Uh, yeah, as long as you as long as you heat it and kneel it. Yeah. Then you like I said, flip it upside down so the bends the, the bow's facing upwards. Then get a kitchen roller and just roll. Yeah, it I, I'm with you, Joe. I'm a bit more cautious, so I sort of pull back from letting it get. I remember to one that, time that, I hit that, that really uh, a piece of mesh. 
uh, style photo which with with some heat and it just it just fell away just yeah pfft, just yeah, too yeah. Thin, disintegrated too thin, yeah. yeah yeah that's why you gotta be really cautious mm. as to how much you heat it up to, yeah but it certainly needs to be heated yep yeah. right Quentin well, good luck with that, that hopefully that helps you out Quentin yeah nice to be able to help somebody um doo -doo -doo -doo. gee that's it that's it yeah um of course if you want to send us an email you can send us an email to on the bench 64 at gmail.com we love hearing from you all and uh write in with your problems write in with your humor show us your bench and don't forget of course you got the other avenue you can uh we've got a uh page set up all for all our listeners which is on your bench on uh, facebook so just go there and uh Join the group of guys and post pictures of your wonderful yeah. models. P quiz, p pictures, questions, answers. <laughs> all that sort of stuff. All right, let's have a, um, a quick break and we'll come back to see what uh, the Falcon has to say. Yeah. Hey everyone, it's Chris at Inside the Armour Publications. I'd like to tell you about what I've got going on at ITA pubs right now. First, I've got a huge restock from Tetra Models, including the Coyote TSV, Jackal 2 and M1278 Heavy Guns Carrier PE sets. The Akagi PE set for the 1700 Hazagawa kit is back in stock. I've got new stuff coming from Wingsy kits including a restock of their ever popular BF109s and also I've still got plenty of copies of Models for Ukraine Volume 2. Please do buy that if you would like to help with humanitarian aid for Ukraine. In addition, I've also got the F4, 148 and 172nd decal sets for 13th TFS at Udorn Air Force Base in the late 60s, which are fantastic for your 172nd or 148 Phantoms. So head on over to InsideTheArmor.com or check out ITA discounts on eBay to find out more about these great products and how you can get your hands on them. All right, well, the Falcon's written in, and uh, he's got quite a few sort of new kits there to talk oh, about. good. So let's have a quick read through. So we start off with aircraft, and Kinetic uh, has a 48-scale Arvo Tutor, which must be getting close oh, to the release date. Tutor, yep. It's on pre-order at Lucky Model. Uh, Kinetic have shown box art, and to no one's surprise, it depicts aircraft from the Snowbirds aerobatic team. Yeah. The kit provides three marking options, two snowbirds and one standard trainer. Not sure how popular this kit will be elsewhere, but it's bound to be what, do boffo business in Canada? What's boffo oh, business? No idea. That's <laughs> Falcon speak. <laughs> <laughs> this was mentioned a couple of years back on um, our show, but it appears that uh, the 48 scale Lockheed uh, P2V Neptune from Jet Mads will become a reality. They have just shown CAD renders. And claim it is coming soon, definitely in 2023. Before anyone gets too excited, it's not injected plastic. It's all 3D printed, apparently. But still, it is 48 scale Neptune. And if it is to the standard of their 30 second scale Vigan, there won't be too many complaints. Oh, cool. Yeah, 48 scale is just a bit too big for me for a Lockheed, uh, for a Neptune. Yeah. Yeah. 70 seconds ago, I'll be happy with, but yeah. <laughs> AMP have shown renders of the Sikorsky S39 Amphibian. Uh, they plan to have both 48 scale and 70 second scale versions. When people saw the post on Facebook, they instantly started complaining it wasn't an S38. <laughs> Par for the course. Our friends at AMG, otherwise known as Arsenal Model Group, have shown sprues for their new tool 70 second scale kits, a Heinkel HE100 and a Junkers JU87A Stuka. Oh, an early Stuka. Uh, the H100, uh, HE100 is said to have an engine. Mm. So the early, the A version of Stuka, I reckon, was quite... quite Ugly? No. Squ I'd, boxy. Well, <laughs> no, I think it was boxy. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I quite liked the lines of it, actually. Mm. Yeah, I thought it as interesting, if not more interesting, no. than the um, later models of Stuka. I don't know, they're all... They're all kind of like they don't have very nice lines. No, I mean, it's a very yeah. cantankerous sort of plane, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's what makes it interesting and appealing. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, mm. you like the ugliness <laughs> of it. <laughs> I do. I have a hobby. Uh, attended uh, a hobby show in Poland recently and showed a new. Uh, uh, sorry, and showed a built model of their forty-eight scale Hurricane. I don't know. I wanted a forty-eight scale Hurricane, but suddenly I have an urge to buy one. 
The surface detail is beautiful, and Armour have really, really captured the look of the aircraft. I predict it's going to be a big seller for Armour. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely have one of those in my want list. Mm. Well, that's um, <coughs> Qatari, aren't they, doing a hurricane next as well? So They are? I thought they were. Not to my knowledge. I know they're doing a Spitfire Mark 1 uh, okay. early right? and a Spitfire Mark 5A. Okay. But I've not heard anything about a hurricane. There you go. Well, I, for one, am happy that there's a 48-scale hurricane on the market that isn't from Airfix. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, that, I didn't look. I, I remember originally building the Hassigal one, which wasn't in a bad kit, but my main disappointment was the fuselage to bottom wing joint which was right in the middle of the fabric area. If they'd moved it forwards like three mil, they would have been able to put it at a panel line and you wouldn't have had a, such a challenge of trying to match the uh, fabric surfaces. I see, like, at, at my skill level at this point in time, I don't think that that would actually give me any trouble. No, nah, but back then it did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> to me, a 72nd scale F-35A Lightning II is coming soon. The model features stealth RAM panels in correct scale thickness. Ooh. A pilot figure with a helmet, beast mode option, canopy opens and closes, and three marking options provided. Two Japanese self-defense force and one US Air Force. The model exhibits a ton of detail for 72nd scale kit and shows Tamiya are still one of the top dogs. Mm. What is beast mode? Oh, beast mode is where it's got all the stuff <laughs> under the pylons and under the wings. So it's, oh, not exposed. In, it's not in stealth mode, yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Beast mode. <laughs> Beast mode. <laughs> Can get up with the lingo, Julian. Come on, man. Uh, rumor time. <coughs> Word from the darkest regions of the interwebs suggests that somebody is about to start work on the 3D model for a 132nd scale. Uh, D14. D14 D520. Yeah. Have no idea who the somebody is, but can make a couple of guesses. However, I'm going to keep those to myself, says the Falcon. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll just have to see what uh, comes of that one. Yep. Civilian vehicles. When first hearing about this, I thought it must have been a prank, but apparently it's real. Hassie Gower are going to release a new kit. I know, shocking, eh? It <laughs> will be one twelfth scale Yamaha RD three fifty LC motorcycle. Yeah, well, that's a new one for to, for uh, Hassi Gower. Mm. I don't know. They don't, uh, 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 they don't normally really. Well, they don't normally release new kits. But no, <laughs> for me, but a, a, a one twelfth scale motorcycle. Yeah, that's a bit weird, isn't it's it? It's more like something you expect from Tamiya. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's going on at uh, Hassi Gower, but um, I mean they've got such a great range of old kits that are crying out to be re-released re-released <laughs> but you know with perhaps some slight tweaks and improvements yeah a4g yeah. for example it wouldn't take much and you know they could make a ton of money out of yeah. it have you seen the house of Gale factory on on google maps no i haven't it's tiny is it really oh really yeah it's pretty small man oh wow it's got a it's got an f104 mounted on the roof well can't be that small then eh, yeah but it, it, <laughs> look for for a factory that's supposed to be you know like when you think about like all the kits that they've got and yeah. all the kits that they have to make and and make, but there's not much there, man. Mm, well, it's also got another plane mounted in on on a pole or something in front of it. And you were over in Japan. You didn't care to visit the factory. I was I was in that city for like one day, man. Oh, there you go. So excuses. <laughs> I'm not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was too busy at the Shizuoka <laughs> model show. You know. <laughs> All right, let's move on to sci-fi. Oh, sci-fi. Oh, yeah. Ravel Germany. Not that we need to mention the German part anymore, as Ravel America ain't coming back. Anyway, Ravel have shown a built-up test shot of their forthcoming 124th scale N1 Starfighter from the latest series of The Mandalorian. The kit depicts the missing panels and exposed interior parts of the N1 as seen in the show. There is also a Mando figure in the pilot seat, though it looks a bit thin to me. Should be quite impressive model when it's painted up in its metallic glory. Mm. Uh, it is a pretty cool looking ship. Oh, it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I reckon probably 24th scale is perhaps the right scale to mm. go for for that particular kit. Yeah, so. I fully agree. Military vehicles. Thunder models have announced two boxings of their 35th scale Berg Panzer Hetzer with two centimetre flak. Late, Late version. version. 
This There will be a standard kit and a limited edition kit with full engine compartment and photo etch mud guards and skirts. Hmm. I Love Kits have shown the box art for the 35th scale XM2001 Crusader self-propelled howitzer. Mm -hmm. uh, Dragon's 35th scale STU Panzer IV Brumbar early is getting another outing. Uh, this release will have a newly tooled and greatly improved wheels plus magic tracks. At this point, I would normally complain about how expensive Dragon Kits are, but they seem to have set a trend as other manufacturers have started asking similar prices. Mm. Oh, that's disappointing. Border Models will release a 35th scale Japanese Army 28cm howitzer from the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. It's an interesting little uh, thing, I wouldn't know. Yeah, Something it is. you wouldn't see often. Italy area to re-release their 35th scale M1A1 Abrams kit. It will be the same old plastic bit, but the decals are new. There will be four options, three U.S. Army with three different camo schemes and one Australian Army tank. Hmm. Uh, not sure that the one that um, is released by Italeri is the correct one for the Aussie version, but I'll stand corrected on that. Uh, not a vehicle, but it can go in here as well at its 35th scale uh, hauler will produce a kit of a German World War II FUSC-65 Würzburg Rise Radar. Oh. That'd be an interesting thing. It's a multimedia kit with resin, photo etch, laser cut, and clear foil parts. The kit, uh, the build-up uh, kit looks most impressive unless the horse posed by it to show the scales of Shetland Pony. The model is quite large. Yeah, the Wurzbergs were a pretty decent-sized radar. Uh, Magic <laughs> Factory released uh, recently in the news for their 48-scale kits of the F4U Corsair have just announced a 3-in-1 kit of the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. You have options of building the M2A3 IFV, an M2A4 IFV, an M2A4 Shorad M. Mm. Amusing Hobby have announced they are working on a new 35th scale kit, the Abrams X main battle tank, which should be a nice companion to their Rhine Metal Panther. And just sneaking in at the end, Naval News. Micromere are ready to release a 72nd scale kit of the Japanese CB class midget Italian, submarine. Italian, not Japanese. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'd say Japanese. Yes, you did. I saw the word midget and automatically went to Japanese. <laughs> So let me say that again. 72nd scale kit of the Italian CB class midget submarine. The kit is injected plastic with a small fret of photo etch. You should look this one up. It has a strong resemblance to the Beatles yellow submarine. Oh, so you can paint it yellow. <laughs> <laughs> you can mod it so it looks like it. Uh, that's it for now from the Falcon. Well, some interesting mm. stuff coming out there, isn't yeah, there? Very so. Cool as... All right, I think we'll have uh, one last quick break and then we'll have a chat with Spud Murphy. What yeah, do you guys? definitely. All right, back very, very shortly. Whether you build aircraft, armour, ships, science fiction, cars or figures, the Fine Scale Modeler magazine provides the how-to information you need to take your modelling to the next level. In each issue of Fine Scale Modeler, you'll find clear how-to features on model assembly and finishing written by experts. Reviews of the hottest model kits and products, tips and techniques for assembling, painting and finishing, as well as inspiring photos of readers' models. To find out how you can get your copy of Fine Scale Modeler, go to www.finescale.com. From time to time, when you're sort of just casting your eyes around Facebook, you come across a particular modeler who just, you, your jaw just drops and you go, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And this happened to me about oh, eight weeks ago, perhaps oh, maybe more than that, a couple of months ago. Um, this name, you know, um, John Spud Murphy just pops up and I have a look at some of his, and I was just gobsmacked by the work. So... We're lucky enough, and this is one of the fantastic things about our show, that I get to actually reach out and talk to people 
And we have with us this uh, on today uh, John Spud Murphy to actually talk about his um, modelling stuff. G'day, John. G'day. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me on to the show. Some ungodly hour in the UK for you, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah, so half 11 at night, so that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, you, um, for, for listeners who perhaps haven't come across your work before, you mainly sort of deal with armour, is that correct? I do, yes, yeah, the predominantly armour. I kind of do build the odd helicopter, and I've done you know a few fixed-wing aircraft sort of projects over the time, but, yeah, predominantly armour, and recently sort of... Uh, Last year or so, we got into the one sixteenth scale. Oh, oh the big good. boys! We can talk about that <laughs> later on. Um, so, did your sort of um, um, way to get into the hobby sort of follow everybody else's path? You started young, or what? What was your um, pathway? Yeah, I started really young. Um, myself and uh, lifelong best friend, a guy called Jeff, uh, both built models together. War gaming when we were kids. Then it became the, you know, teenager, girls, college, um, going out drinking, life getting in the way, family and things like that. And I was given a Tamiya Yag Tiger, the sort of original Yag Tiger years ago in the early 90s, as a random Christmas present. I hadn't built a kit for years. Um, and, you know, my sort of wife at the time said, oh, you know, you've got nothing, you know, it's winter, nothing better to do, build this kit. And I hugely got into uh, motocross racing. Uh, so I kind of had quite a competitive spirit. Um, built this Yag Tiger, went to the local news agents randomly to buy a dirt bike magazine. And uh, there was this same kit on the front of a magazine. And I was like, why does that look so good? And why does mine look, you know, like I'd painted it with a hairy stick or just <laughs> dipped it in the paper. And, uh, and kind of like, but the thing was, I was at that age and that, you know, I, to me, like model making was a thing I'd done as a child. I felt it was like really uncool and I was kind of trying to find a magazine to put this model magazine inside to take it to the counter <laughs> to pay for it. Like, you know, so trying to hide it inside something random, like, you know, track the monthly or something. And, and, uh, and ask for and, a, a brown paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was definitely one of those. And uh, and took it home, read, and was like, what's an airbrush? All these sort of techniques. And so it just went from there. Um, and I uh, entered a couple of competitions after I'd built a few kits, did quite well. And it was a really bizarre thing. Um, I went to the competition, got prize money, got given extra kits, you know, as a, as a prize. And I was thinking, wow, this is really cool. I'm, you know, with motocross, you race your brains out, crash yourself, spend a fortune wrecking your bike to get like a plastic trophy. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and like I say, all of, the worst I've done is probably cut a finger and spill some glue. And, and you know, I've got some free models to help sort of sponsor the hobby. Um, and after a little while, I, I kind of did quite well at the old Euro military show. Um, and then was approached by uh, one of the magazine editors in the... Uh, I guess this must have been about the mid 1990s, and so I ended up writing quite regular features for Military and Scale, then the Tamiya magazine. Um, eventually, I left the Air Force and was offered a full-time job as the editor of Model Military International, which was part of the ADH Publishing, the same people who ran the Tamiya magazine. Right. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I worked there for them as their uh, uh, model, uh, military modeling editor. Um, three years there, then, uh, I left, Brett Green took over from me, um, and I went to America to work for, uh, Military Miniatures in Review. Oh, okay, um, right, it, right. Yeah, I, I, I've run that one for a couple of years. That's a, a entirely different story that's probably quite liable as if I went into any detail. <laughs> uh, we'll um, steer clear of that one then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I did two years over there and then came back, um, was offered a job by MIG with the original AK Weather magazine. But uh, kind of, it, again, it was it was part-time work. I was, I'd gone back to aircraft engineering and it, I was sort of burnt out at that point. So now it's just purely a hobby and I do the odd article for AFE Modeler. 
um, and just just really enjoy sort of putting your bits on Facebook and and it being my hobby again, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. getting getting back to the grassroots. Yeah yeah, 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 mm. yes, yeah, and and brought my enthusiasm back. You know, when it's when it's a job, you know, when it's, it stops becoming your hobby and it becomes a grind, um, you know, you, you lose that that sort of. Oh, you certainly do, and that's and that's why you know you you gotta yeah. be careful what you wish for because you know some people think oh it'd be great to do this full time, but yeah, I don't think so. No, and you know I used to get lots and lots of people uh, approach me over the time when I was editing, saying exactly that, saying oh that'd be the best job in the world to build models full time. Mm. No, you know when you've got all the editors have got the deadlines, so you know it's we need to fill the pages, and you get to often build models that maybe not your thing um but because of the newest releases and obviously the magazines are obliged to sort of produce or produce articles on the newest kits to give people a you know uh, a review of them um so yeah and and also none of the magazines pay very well anyway so you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's really should be really hard pressed you'd have to work you know with like a 40 hour day and churn out half a dozen models a week to you know even scratch a living really to yeah, be honest yeah. unless you're a big name manufacturer you're never gonna get rich in this hobby exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um well it's funny you and will patterson you should uh, have a chat to him because he used to be a mad dirt bike racer as well so i think you guys have a lot in common actually <laughs> yeah we, we have yeah i actually did do a, a podcast with will which which uh the first one i did was the plastic posse one which was very sort of um just very nice and nice and gentle and kind of very polite and then i went on the one with will patterson and it was all <laughs> you can swear and say whatever you want it was, it was, it was like the r-rated version of a, a modeling podcast <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely it's a great show <laughs> So if our listeners want to sort of go and check out some of your work, um, while we uh, continue to talk to John, you should go and check out his Facebook page, which is John Spud Murphy's Model Bench. And It is, that's it, yeah. John, we're just looking at some uh, pictures here. I'm just going to start and dive in with the way you approach um, weathering tracks because for me that's always been my Achilles heel when it comes to doing armour. Um, in fact, it sort of I shy away from doing armour because doing the tracks always terrifies me. Not because I can't, you know, assemble them, but I'm always worried that it's not going to look look right. And somehow you managed just to key right in and, and bang. And I'm looking at uh, your Sherman Easy Eight, I think it is, with the uh, oh, yeah, yeah. with the tracks you've done on that, and it's just drop dead gorgeous the way you've uh, got the um, dirt and everything. Do you, can you step through how you actually sort of do that from the beginning right through to the weathering stage? Yeah, sure. Um they're all they're all uh glued together using like uh the mr hobby sp glues quite hot glue dry stuff very quickly um so, so this, these dry, are individual link tracks or they're um they are yeah they were individual link tracks yeah and, and i think um they are about in old school about two and a half feet long per side so right quite that's quite a, lot. a feat to actually, <laughs> that's a, yeah it's so a the, big set oh, of tracks right, another fairly large links yeah yeah it's just, and it's one of those you know if you're used to 35th scale when you've got something that's you know 30 centimeters long it's not a problem but when you've got something that's sort of like you know almost 90 centimeters long almost a meter long you it's how are you going to weather them when and yeah. Bench, bench space if nothing else you know but um yeah i i tend to um use the tamiya um, dark iron as a, a base color now for for most of my tracks. Totally avoid all these red browns and sort of like rust colors. Mm. Just find them too vibrant. So I go for like a very gray based um, color. And certainly with the these tracks, um, this was all built up. I find with the um, 16 scale, it's it's about the textures rather than the paints themselves, you know, because of the, the scale, you you can actually, you, you would see the scale rust, the texture and rust and things. Um, so it was pretty much all built up with um, a couple of layers of, uh, I mix an oil paint, um, the Aptoy Lung range. Then I've got some of this VMS. Um, it's their pigment texture. It's just a white product, but it's quite grainy. So it gives you an extra texture. And then I'll use either the AK or the MIG um, kind of pre-made 
uh, enamel based mud products mix it all in to get together it's like a kind of slurry paste and then literally just um use a toothbrush and start flicking oh, it yeah, all yeah, over yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does make a an awful mess but this is just on the outside of the track so you know the the contact surfaces with the ground and and then once i've got that done i'll use a you know a q-tip cotton bud uh just dipped in white spirits and then i'll just start wiping off the actual contact areas of the track oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and then that will then leave the um dark iron showing through and then from there i can uh, i'll use the sort of metal colors from mr hobby uh you know the burnishable paints just to, to give that sort of bright highlight so it is literally just kind of you are making a real almost like a a real mud out of enamel products and, fl and flicking it on the model it's as sort of simple as that really and the layers will just you know if you sometimes it's often a case of more than one application and you'll start to see it really sort of take shape um and that was as simple it was really for the for the tracks and and and, and at that scale, you can get the individual sort of blades of grass almost down in there as well. Um, it looks you can, yeah. Really cool. Yeah, that, that's totally randomly. It's just the, those little balls of sea grass that you can get. I think it's sort of fairly predominant in the uh, Mediterranean coastline, and this stuff just washes up on the beaches. And, you know, it's great for cutting up to sort of like a beigey brown colour, and you can just chop it up into your know, very stubbly little sections just sprinkle a small amount in with that sort of slurry paste i've made yeah and yep. you know it's, it's quite a random effect uh, but it does seem to to work well mm, it definitely does the other one that caught my eyes because i'm also got it but it's sitting in the shelf of doom at the moment is the um australian army centurion that you built up the vietnam um version and oh uh, yeah oh. yeah that <laughs> it looks just drop dead gorgeous um oh, thank you I'm, I'm having trouble with the back deck i can't the the hull is a bit um uh warped and i can't get the back deck on properly without sort of sanding a whole heap of um material away so i'm just trying to figure out how to get around that but interestingly i, I was i was intrigued the way you sort of um started on that you um obviously built the model and um did what looks like a um um just a, a coat, but then you started working on the rust side of stuff before you moved on to doing the overall colour of the. So the, you worked on the rust of the exhaust before you started moving uh, doing the overall um, OD on the rest of the on the rest of the vehicle. I did, yeah, yeah. That was purely because I was kind of trying something a little, little bit different, a little bit new, sort of a bit of experimentation, and I think I wanted to sort of make sure. I don't know why I just found on that those centurions that's such a key feature that quite mm. a distinctive rust pattern on those exhaust guards so i felt that until i'd got that i was happy with that then i didn't want to progress with the rest of the the model yeah that makes um, sense and, yeah and, and and weirdly um i'd actually built a very very similar australian centurion um years ago which actually was for the american military ministries and review magazine right um and you know, speed on a few years later, I, I'm back here, and I was at the Bovingdon Tank Museum at a model show, and there's a, a chap there called Stephen who was the, I think he was the colonel of the First Royal Tank Regiment in the UK, and he had one of the one six scale Armatech radio control tanks that's Ooh. probably worth more than my car, <laughs> um, and and. Uh, with exactly the same markings. So we got chatting, getting friends, and I actually gave him the model. Um, so it's, you know, in his office, back at his, his house. Yeah. So um, I kind of vowed that one day I would build another one. And so I'd, the original Centurion that I built, um, I was weathering the exhaust guards again, you know, trying to make it a sort of key feature. And if you could actually see how I work, I, I just find it so, I'm, I'm the world's worst. You know, you look at Martin Kovac, Night Shift, all these guys, and they've got these immaculate studios that you could probably operate on a person. You know, that's <laughs> mine. It's like if I was to turn the camera around, <laughs> you'd just be like, oh, dear. Like, no. <laughs> and uh, it's like, you know, it's like, a, you know, it's like a finger paint stuff. And <laughs> I'd, I, I, I 
doing one of these that uh, you know where I'm I'm not watching what I'm doing. I'm dipping brushes in what I'm assuming is white spirits and. Sometimes I've looked around and I've ended up putting a brush in my coffee or it's gone. <laughs> and I, I'd happen to dip the brush by accident into cellulose thinners, thinking I was, you know, putting white spirits on. And it caused the whole of this exhaust guy, the paint to all crinkle up and shrivel and all. It just looked absolutely horrendous. But it was that thing, right, don't do anything, wait for it to dry, just calm down before you try and kind of clear the mess up and make more of a mess yeah mm-hmm. and when it dried it was like oh my god this is the this is it you know eureka moment <laughs> <laughs> could i get the effect right on the other side yeah. <laughs> that's I, the I, that's I, the challenge yeah because you know when i wasn't realizing what i was doing of course then when you were there holding a brush knowing that it's loaded with cellulose thinners and you're thinking I'm just going to make this an absolute sort of pig's ear. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, so yeah, I learned a lot of techniques from the original Centurion. And obviously in the sort of time between, I sort of discovered some new techniques and, you know, as we do, so hopefully move on a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I, same thing, wanted to get the exhaust right. Um, and I've been using the life color. They do a rust and dust set. Yeah, of I've, I've got that uh, the rust and, stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and and those three colors, I just find a few. Basically, it was just a sponge technique, but not allowed, not cleaning the sponge between the three colors, so they would start to you know mix, and it gave just such a really really subtle um, graduation between the colors, and. Um, and yeah, it was you know it was like oh, wow you know so it's now my sort of go to to product for the the rust. Once I was happy with that, I then you know felt I could move on with the rest of the model, the olive- including uh, I. Sorry, get. Yeah, no, you go. You finish off what you're going to say before I dive in. Oh, so, yeah. So um, it was it was the first time I'd actually, I I, I wouldn't even know how to sort of describe it. It was so I airbrushed it in very very pale green colours. You know, I, I found a wealth of information online, some really cool original color photos of the Centurions in Vietnam. And notice they were, became, they were very pale, chalky green, you know, where they sort of exposed all the weather in. So that was the sort of effect I was after. So I went for a very, very pale, I think it's a, a, a Japanese aircraft color called Hay, which is part of the... Um, Mr. Hobby range. Once, once I've got that on, you know, in this sort of like almost like the fashionable modeling effect that, um, you know, is very popular at the moment. Yeah. And then I used um, the Ag, Ag Toy Long, do a color called Industrial Earth, which is actually almost like an olive drab. So I, I basically dry brushed that over the entire model um, and it gave like a, a translucent glaze that just toned down and gave some depth and uh, darkened the, the base colour and kind of gave this, I thought, like a really, really subtle, nice effect. And, yeah, the only I, the only thing is with the oil paints, you know, I'd kind of leave it a week before it fully, fully sort of dried yeah. before I could kind of move on. But, again, because I'm building for myself now, um, I've not got any time constraints where, you know, when I was doing stuff for magazines, you know, you've got to find all the techniques that dry really, really quickly cut corners constantly you know the mm, old cliches of yeah. one half of the tank and stuff like that so you know i can take my time mate just just, well, pa- just paint the areas that can yeah. be photographed <laughs> you actually yeah, yeah, I, yeah i literally have in 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 the past yeah you know it's like you know when you we see people they've got their, their you know the tank on a plank type diorama mm. or the, you know model base and they've got a mirror on, on the bottom to show the weather and on the other side of the tank and i'm thinking oh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit much that, you know, <laughs> but yeah 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 that's julian's pet hate the uh, model sitting on the mirror <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I i did it did it once with an aircraft and it was ironically that it was it was a, one of these um dornier 335 arrows yeah and i was more pleased with the underside than I was with the top. Um, and I, I did, I, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm a modeler, I've built an aircraft and I'm really you know, pleased with it. And I did that 
put it on a mirror, but it was just one of these cheap pieces of acrylic. Mm -hmm. And all it did was just highlight the dust at every model show, which is, you know, as I say, 90% of dust, (laughs) human skin. So I was just thinking, right, all I'm doing is just highlighting all the human skin that's floating around in this model show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you you certainly nailed that uh, olive drab on that centurion. That just looks um, absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And uh, kudos for um, actually getting getting it to that point because it's always something that i know aussie armor modelers sort of struggle with is getting the correct id because at any one time it can be a different sort of shade depending on where it is within the country and what you know operation has been on and in um much like your um we 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 celebrate um um what's that big day where the tankers all get together and go hoorah um you're the Cambry, tank, you're Cam, the Cam, Cambry Day, Cambry. Oh, oh Cambry. Yeah, yeah. Cambry. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where they polish all the tanks and they go on parade and you know drive around the parade circle and salute each other, all sort of stuff. And that's when you find the tanks highly polished and you know not a speck of dirt on it because the RSM obviously yeah. goes around and checks. But even then, there's, it, yeah. there's subtle variations in, in the in the in the camouflage colours and if they're OD in, within the OD as well. Oh and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, some people are uh, obsess over the colours, but I, th- I just try and get a, a ballpark kind of the colour that seems to s- suit my mind's eye. And, you know, I think with armour, no one's ever sort of said to me, that colour is wrong. So, yeah. you know, that's always, it's always a good thing that you think I'm within that spectrum. I don't the- think there is a wrong colour though, John, is there? No, no, but... Well, unless you paint it red. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> but you know... Yeah. At, 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 at some point, somewhere in the world, the, the tank is going to be perhaps as you represented it at that point in time. You see what I'm sort of saying? Yeah, that's right. When when I did this, the Centurions, both of them actually, um, you know, I, I kind of went on Google Earth, went to Street View in the areas of operation in Vietnam, you know, thanks to, you know, technology now, and you can walk along the road virtually yeah. and look at the side of the road and see the colour of the dirt and yeah, just go, right, yeah. that's, that's the colour I need for the for the model, you know. And then when someone sort of says, oh, well, that tank was in Vietnam, it should be bright orange dust, and you go, well, actually, no. Like, you know, yeah, you go yeah. full anorak, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> mm. it, it, within within Vietnam, there's so many different areas. I mean, the, the, that bright red was sort of up in the central highlands sort of area, you know, around yeah. sort of Khe San. Um, whereas the, the, the common sort of um, dirt and stuff was, you know, re- and Vietnam's such a, a, a big country, so the, the geographic yeah. sort of changes in the soil throughout the entire country are huge. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and even when we – sorry. <laughs> no, go on, go ahead, finish off. I'm, 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 I've got so many yeah, things so to talk about, I'm trying to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it, 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 just when we, we drove home today, um, you know, uh, down to the southwest of England, we'd only – covered uh, about 150 miles and you go from the chalk uh, of the Salisbury Plain area then as you get to uh, the area of East Devon you've got we've got that very very red soil yeah same as you get in Vietnam and then 30 well 30 40 kilometers further west where I live it's back to sort of your beige color soil you know and that's so where people just assume what they've got that cliched because of maybe the Linden or whatever in the old days that it had to be that Bright red. Yeah. And if you didn't yeah. do that, you were yeah. wrong. Yeah. You know. Exactly right. Mm. Yeah, I've just, um, John. I've just been checking out your uh, First World War. I think it's French armored car. Uh, I don't think I built a Fr- First World War. Oh, um, no, that's, that's probably pic- not mine. Pictures of somebody else's. Oh, it's just someone else's. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's not. Too, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, Dan Sankey does World War One stuff. If it's one of my, my friends um, from our model club but yeah I don't, I don't do first world war stuff at all yeah, yeah. <laughs> i like it because you can go, you can go crazy with but, the weathering i reckon but, <laughs> but but if it's good i'll take the credit for it yeah <laughs> <laughs> um the other thing i want to have a chat about is the way you do your welds on uh, on your armor builds you must perhaps step through right. and uh, talk to talk how you do that yeah it's, um kind of the the first one is basically you know sort of um, stolen from Martin Kovac, but using the green stuff putty um, and just roll it into very, very fine sort of s- sausages for one mm. of the better term. And, you know, 
laying that against or butting it up against the joint, you know, um, certainly on like the Easy 8 Sherman, there were so many extra welds to add. Um, and I, you know, once you've got this thin sausage laid into the, the groove, um, I bought a, a set of woodworking, tiny little woodworking chisels. Um, and one of them's like a kind of half crescent moon, you know, moon shape. Oh, I was going to ask and, you how you did that. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I think they were, it was probably like three or four pounds for a set of, I think, six or eight shaped chisels. Well, that's, that's reasonable. And, yeah, they, they, yeah. And, you know, the others have all just gone in sort of tools drawer. But this crescent shaped one, um, I did take it into work and just thin it a little bit, you know, make it a little bit narrower on a grinding wheel. Um, and it's just perfect for giving that arced shaped mm. weld. Um, and you, you, you know, you basically just work your way up the weld and as you press the, the tool into it, you'll actually, instead of just pressing it invertedly, you're going at about sort of 60 degree angle as you're working your way along the weld and it will naturally push that scallop into like, it will hump it up, you know, sort of bulge it up and then you just oh, yeah, as you yeah. work along you'll see the welds grow as you go go mm. along and uh, you know and it's one of those um if it's a little bit too prominent you can just use a brush with some water in it and just go over it lightly with the brush and it'll just take you know soften the most pronounced ones um and yeah it's a really really simple kind of it's quite a therapeutic way of producing the welds actually oh, i would be yeah <laughs> Yeah, um, I, it looks that's fantastic. my way of saying it's. It, yes, yeah, that's my polite way of saying it's mind-numbingly boring. Actually, <laughs> it's, like, it's one thing on it's one thing on thirty fifth scale, but when you've got something the size of that Easy Eight, and you just think, oh, this was a good idea, not. Like, you know. <laughs> so, well, it, um, one sixteenth scale armor is all the rage at the moment. It's sort of you know everybody seems yeah. to be sort of pushing it out, and um, I don't know whether to comment on the fact uh, of the. Um, aging sort of population <laughs> whether it's um i don't know um we've right. all got more money so we can buy bigger toys oh this gets that i guess that's the yeah. case as well yeah um ha- what what's your thought i mean because obviously you get from a modeling point of view yes you've got more opportunities to sort of dive in and do more um uh detailing on it but then you've got the opposing thing is you get this huge sort of 116 scale kit you've got to sort of display somewhere so um, um, <laughs> yeah, our, our Sarah absolutely hates them. Like you know, she she likes the thirty fifth scale stuff, and then when I built the Stuart, the first one that I did sixteenth scale, and she was just like, "Is that bigger than your normal ones?" No, <laughs> no, nope, you're just much, you're just much closer. You know, it's like it's a little sort. Of, like, it's it's an optical illusion. Rather, rather ten, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know, and. I, I kept kind of saying to myself, right, a Stuart in 16th scale is not much bigger than, say, a uh, main battle tank in 35th scale. Mm. And that was how I was convincing myself that, you know, it was it was okay. And uh, the Stuart went into AFE Modeler magazine, and because of that, I ended up getting sent the uh, Dasworks Stug 3. Oh. And I was like, great, open <laughs> the box. And it was like, oh, this is a lot bigger. <laughs> it, was, it was like, you know, and uh, oddly, or strangely enough, um, I went on the Plastic Posse podcast and I, um, Scott Gentry had said to me, have you got like a, a kit that would be your ultimate? And I sort of said, oh, you know, because I've always liked Yag Tigers. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I'd only really built the Stuart without giving it a second thought. I said, oh, yeah, you know, Big Yag Tiger would be cool. And then I got offered one, and then it turned <laughs> up, and it was just like, and it kind of, I had to do that, you know, the old sort of, oh, God, I have to sneak this into the house without, like, you know, Sarah, Sarah finding it, like, you know, we kind of literally hid it in a suitcase, which it just about filled. Um, and at that point, you know, I was thinking, oh, this was really, really not a good idea going to 16th scale. But I think, <laughs> I go into the Stug next. I kind of worked myself, worked my way up in increments. So again, the the Easy Eight bigger again, and um, I, obviously I presume you can see the Easy Eights on the yeah, sort of yeah yeah. And so it's at 
sort of about 80, 90% now. There's just some weather in stowage to go. So I actually dug out the Yag Tiger and I've put the Yag Tiger next to the the Sherman and you just think, oh God, this is. This is and, <laughs> and, you know, and I've already gone down that. I'm going to replace all the weld seams and I'm going to do this. And there's probably, I think, if you add up this, you probably could end up ended up having like about three or four meters of weld seams. So I'm going to have oh, to. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. When you sort of, you know, so all the, you know, um, into uh, interleave joints and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I think that will probably be my the end of my foray into 16th scale, just probably for not having the space to be able to keep any yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. But I, I've really enjoyed them, though. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That um, I wonder if um, how many people have gone to one sixteenth scale and then come back and gone. Yeah, that was uh, interesting, but I think I'll stay in the more reasonable sized. Yeah, yeah. It, this it um, when people you know it's that thing where people say, oh, you know, sixteenth scale is great because my eyes are sort of not as good as they used to be and all that sort of stuff. But I found that each component or accessory piece of stowage pioneer tool is becomes a model in its own right mm, yes. so, you know mm. it, and you know and and i think on on um i said on the facebook page i, I was waiting for some uh, oil paint effects to dry on the sherman so i dug out a shelf queen 35th scale uh uh stim tiger oh, i love those things and, yeah and i got it out and i was like this can't be right. And it just felt like I was looking at a 48 scale kick. So, <laughs> so, so tiny. And then I was, I was like, how do people paint these models? They're so small. You know? <laughs> imagine yeah, especially stepping, with, especially when you start having to tackle like ambush schemes. Oh, imagine stepping down a 70 second scale after doing that. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you find that? Yeah, um, that yeah. So do, do you find that uh, with the 35th scale? Yeah. Like, oh, that's right. I use tweezers. For all of this sort of stuff, and I didn't need to on the one sixteenth. One sixteenth scale, yeah, that's right, yeah. And and what was strange is because obviously I've uh, been working on the um, uh, fifty caliber machine guns uh, or uh, machine gun on the, uh, the Sherman, and I've also another shelf queen I've got is a Dragon M forty eight Vietnam one that's got two fifty cals on the turret, and I was like, I needed something to occupy my time while I was waiting for the oil paints to dry so it was either a toss-up between this stream stream tiger and the m48 and i've got the m48 out of, out of the box you know and it's all base colored decals are on and i looked at the 50 cows and it was like oh bless aren't they cute and they, was, <laughs> they just seemed so ridiculously small and it was it was really strange trying to get my head around the fact that no that's the scale i've been used to for years and i know exactly how big a 35th scale 50 cal is but having all of a sudden, you've got to readjust everything because you've just got used to everything. Obviously, it's been so much larger. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. How, how you, the um, advent of 3D printing, obviously, and, and I know that you've obviously used it for your um, 50 cal. Um, it's yeah. been an absolute godsend, I'd have to say. Uh, how are you finding oh. um, the raft of uh, different stuff you can get in 3D print now? Um, yeah, I've, I've seen sort of both ends of the spectrum, really. I've had some stuff that's been shockingly bad. Mm. Um, but as obviously people were investing in better printers, it's all, it's all still a bit of a dark art to me. You know, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, I originally when I went to college after leaving school, I was a draftsman. Um, so I do find all the sort of CAD stuff, I, you know, I've really got an interest in it. But I think it would just divert me from my modeling time. Yeah. Because yes. I ended up spending too much time designing some little widget to go on the tank. So I kind of I'm in a fortunate position where either I can get stuff sent to me or if you know, I can afford to buy the bits and pieces, you know, we've got more disposable income. Mm, so mm. I just think, you know what, I'll just click buy and I've, someone's done all the hard work for me. But um but yeah, it's you know, um for me the biggest thing for me is i absolutely detest etched brass can't stand the stuff um <laughs> sacrilege <laughs> sacrilege I, I, it's it's i'm one of these that i tend to glue 
the etch brass to the it'll stick to the tweezers better than it will the model you know and, and it's and i just get so frustrated with it and uh there was a while when i was in the air force i was in uh like an avionics bay and we spent kind of most of the day sat at a bench soldering um components together and i was thinking i want to be outside fighting the world and you know flying yeah. around and doing stuff like this and so I, I just was like i'm not soldering as part of my hobby because i've done it for so long <laughs> as, a, as a real job so it's like and you know and like i say super glue i never seem to have much luck with it but the advent of all the 3d printing things like german tool clamps and stuff like that it's given me a resurgence in say german armor because i used to think i'd love to build a particular model but i really can't be bothered with all the photo etched tool clamps yeah now they're in 3d printing you know it's kind of rekindled my enthusiasm again for a lot of projects that i've shelved purely because of the, the etch brass issue yeah i get that i understand makes sense <laughs> I'm probably not going to get sponsored by Edward or Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because like you, you would get like a Tamiya kit, and then you look at some of the the straps and things, and then they're not either not there or they're very very overscale. And you think, well, yeah. if I really wanted to do a proper job of it, I'd have to go for the photo etch. But do I really want to fold up all these straps and and brackets and things like that? Not really. Yeah. And well, well, John, you're lucky you, know, you don't do ships. Yeah. Oh, I, thought, I know. Yeah, I, that, I, I do actually have a, a 350 scale Nimitz that I kind of started a long, long time ago. Um, and I've got the, um, I think it's white ensign yep. photo etch set, yep, there, yep. which is huge, <laughs> where you can build all the new masts and stuff and then there's all the railings and stuff and it was just like yeah that's going back in the box <laughs> and, and it's just and uh, you know uh, um we've we've moved uh, sarah and i's jobs we've changed quite a lot so we've moved quite a few houses and this this poor trumpeter nimitz box is just hanging because it's had it's just been moved and thrown <laughs> up in every loft in every place we've moved to and you know and uh, and I almost don't want to even look in the box to even see if it's still in sort of remotely in one piece. But, you know, so if someone does all that in 3D printed, there may be a chance it will be oh, resurrected. Yeah. You'd, you'd be surprised. Yeah, there I'd, probably I'd, is a lot of stuff available for that 3D printed. Yeah, is the, the railings are interesting at that scale. And, um, you know, God forbid, 700 scale doing railings. Um, obviously, you can do it in photo etch, but 3D print, you probably could. Um, I haven't really seen any sort of coming out no, in, at the moment so uh, the ship model still sticking with um, photo, etch. photo etch at the moment so yeah interesting question I'm I'm kind of like you John but I did get a 3D printer but my philosophy is I'll just buy the the files and print it out myself rather than yeah. um, than um, design you know, the stuff yeah yeah because I I mean I'm so time poor geez I'm struggling to even get to the bench um, most sort of weeks let alone um, you know, sitting down in front of a computer and designing a, a file or something like that. So um, I'm, I'm it, always it's almost like a shortcut. It's almost a whole different hobby. And you have to sort of commit it, it to is. having two hobbies, you know? Yeah, you yeah. Go that, but that but far. The, the, the way I've sort of tackled it is I'm, I'm sort of um, trying to cut the middle now, <laughs> I guess, if you want to sort of... I'm going direct to the uh, designer and then printing it myself rather than buying it already printed, I guess. So, yeah. Or having to do the CAD work. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Mm, yeah, you know, you know I, I'm exactly that for me. I'm bad enough when you know I, I, you put something on. You know, you're looking for a bit of research or information on, say, you know, on YouTube, and you you go down that rabbit hole and you start watching a particular video. You think I'll look for um, some World War Two footage, like I was doing for the Easy Eight for the the extra the applique armor, and kind of getting a feel for the weathering, just watching some of these old archive footage. Yeah, and then. Before I know it, I'm then watching uh, top ten dirt bike fails, and then it's pimple <laughs> popper and things like that. And you just think, how did we get from? <laughs> like, it's, the, it's the rabbit hole. The U.S. armor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I have to sort of be like, stop it. You know, get back to the bench. You know, and because I'll only be cursing myself when I'm in work all day, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I'd rather be home at the bench now. And I'll think, yeah, I, I had last night, but I ended up watching. 
<laughs> move pop in us. Exactly like, like that. You know, yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so easily distracted, and then oh, and then, Ooh, and, then <laughs> and then I feel guilty because I've missed out in that time that I've already put aside to do modelling and went, oh, I should have done it and I didn't because I was too busy <laughs> yeah, going down rabbit holes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I'm literally, you know, like in the cartoons where the sort of dog goes squirrel and then and <laughs> yeah. it's gone like, you know. And, and so, right. so. <laughs> it really sucks when you get to Monday and you think, a whole weekend passed and I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, that's the worst. I, I, and the worst, the worst thing for me is I... I, I work for the Ministry of Defence now, and I, it's kind of it's, I, I can't say too much about what I do. It's it, I work with you know, on like submarines, um, and I really need to concentrate on what I'm doing yeah. during the daytime. But when you're sort of going, oh, I can't wait to get home and weather this and do this and do that, and you're like, no, I really need to be focusing on what I'm doing. Now, <laughs> you know, sort of like, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm. I'm Really conscious that um, you're sort of well past midnight over there, but um, there's still a couple of things I sort of want to tease out yeah, uh, from you. That's no problem. Um, obviously, you're very close to the continent, so you can sort of dash across. And, of course, you've got Telford as well over there. And I know yeah. you got picked, um, tapped on the shoulder to be a judge over at one of the um, majors over there in Europe recently. Yeah, that's right, for Scale Model Challenge. Ooh, and, uh, well done. done. So, yeah, really cool. We, we went last year to the... World Model Expo, which uh, Rob Conbecki was running, which is in the same venue, um, and uh, so yeah, their their annual show, which is um, Scale Model Challenge. Um, uh, yeah, been invited. Sam Dwyer is going over. He'll, he'll yep. be judging the armor class as well. So it's going to be a really really good weekend. Um, quite a group of us going over from the UK from our uh, model club, this Four Corners Model Club that we sort of set up a, a year or so ago. Um, uh, there's um, Pete Usher, uh, Phil Stakinskus, um, Lester Plaskett, Kev Smith, Darren Thompson, Dan Sankey. Uh, Almost like a who's who. Adrian Davies. Yeah, <laughs> Adrian Davies. Uh, and yeah, Andy Evans. So, you yeah, know, absolutely sort of like the the sort of top modelers and just incredible work. So, yeah, we've, we've been invited over to have a stand, which is uh, very sort of very privileged for that because they don't invite many clubs to go there and display mm. and pretty much most of us are going to be judging as well which oh, is that's fantastic. Really cool and, and daunting just mm. for the sheer number of models that are, yeah. are entered you know like thousands wow <laughs> that'd be that'd be really I'm, really cool and yeah, hopefully yeah, one day we can, but, um your thoughts on where the hobby's going um i I think it's at a really, really good place at the mm. moment. You know, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I, I know there's been all this sort of debacle with the American uh, IPMS thing that their president posted up, and you know, it caused a lot of controversy on online. But I think you know, um, we are we are in an aging part of the hobby you know the aircraft and armor models but you've got all the sort of gundam stuff and yeah. you've got all the, the generation of kids that have been playing like um world of tanks and stuff like that that have gone on to build the actual model of the tank that yeah. you know, they're driving around again so you know i know we sort of some people seem to think that once our generation goes the hobby is going to die but it's not it will just diversify and mm. you evolve know, and yeah and no, i think it exactly for what happened for myself and many many other guys you know modeling friends that we started off as kids little airfix kits matchbox kits you you know you life gets in the way you know families and all this stuff as i said earlier but then you know often you'll return to the hobby because the seed's already been sown and I think it'll just carry on. So the, yeah. the kids that are building models, G Gundam stuff or, you know, something that... Well, that's exactly right, John. I think, and, and I think Warhammer is to this generation oh, yeah, what yeah. Airfix was to our generation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I forgot all about you. Know, Warhammer, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one that's absolutely huge. Um, and inevitably, I think, you have that lull where people uh, generally sort of 20s, 30s, m maybe the early 40s, they'll be doing other stuff. Um, but then 
they will come I, I think a large portion will come back to the hobby so you've just got to be patient that you know mm. for a period of people's lives modeling's not a concern mm. but at some point they'll, they'll revert back to type well, yeah no, fully agree what's on your bench at the moment john um the easy eight sherman <laughs> so that, that just feels like it's you know they they uh, unlike 35th kits, kits they do seem to stay on the bench for a long time and <laughs> i think because of the the products and the the way that the approaches i'm using um a lot more oils so i've yeah. just got to be a lot more patient with them because you know that just purely for the nature of how long they take to dry yeah yeah, yeah. And they take I up the entire bed. The <laughs> There's not much room yeah. for a side projects. And, you know, I, I used to have two, three, four kits on the go at any one time, but I think with the 16th scale, um, you know, we if I'm waiting for something on the hull of the turret to dry, I'll then start working on the stowage because again, each especially American tanks are so full of stowage. You know, in each mm. ammo box, each you know. Like again, it's a, a model in its own right. So, um, so even though I might be taking a break from the actual vehicle, I'm still working on parts of that project. So, you know, I think the the poor little Sturm Tiger thought it had its it was going to get its <laughs> moment in the limelight. You know, where I cut all these circles out, and it's like, yes, I'm being finished, thank you. And then, and it's like. No, he's gone back to the bloody Sherman again later. <laughs> <laughs> John, really appreciate being in the show, and especially considering the time difference between um, yes. here and the UK. So thanks very much, uh, mate, for that. Not, not, if, not a problem at all. No, thank you. People want to uh, find and follow your work. Where can they go? It is uh, just really Facebook, the John Spud Murphy's model bench. Um, so, you know, not a big following, but it's just something. It was just a way of kind of putting my work on social media without all of my dirt biking friends and modeling, uh, you know, Air Force friends and yeah. stuff like that going, oh dear, what this <laughs> sad guy <laughs> posting up now, like, you know, sort of, sort of, yes. sort of, sort of save them from it, really. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, occasionally stuff going in AFE modeler. Cool. And Spud, how did that nickname come about? That's the traditional nickname for anybody called Murphy. Um, right. You know, the Irish potato famine in Ireland, yeah, yep, yep, yeah, and, gotcha. and Mur Murphy's the most common name in Ireland. But oh. as my uh, grandfather was Irish, um, came over, he was in Royal Engineers um, during World War One, so uh, so that's that's where that comes from. And you know, generally, uh, it's only like Sarah and. You know, my parents were the only people that called me John. You know, so any, any of you <laughs> John out in the street, I won't even look around it. So, you know, it's just like, yeah, so, so, so used to getting called Spud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mate, thanks very Mate, much. Thanks. And thanks so much for uh, being on the show. And um, oh, look forward you. to following you and seeing what other wonderful projects yeah, you come definitely. up with. Um, to feel free to reach out and give us a hoy if you've got something interesting to talk about. And um, love to have you I on the show be. again. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, thanks very much for inviting me on. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Oh, thanks no for being on, mate. Thank thanks, you. mate. Well, that was one very interesting interview. Oh, with, definitely. Uh, John. He's, so, he's such a talented <clears throat> artist. Too. I know. And again, if you haven't seen his stuff, um, I would highly recommend you yeah, go to his Facebook on, page, yeah, jump on Facebook, and, and, and have a look. It um, is really, really super cool. Mm. So um, go and check him out. Um, and I said he's the 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 way he does his tracks has uh, just got me sort of gobsmacked. I reckon it's just absolutely brilliant. And See, um, I, re I reckon you could you could uh, fairly easily copy that for one for one. Um, like his method. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Because and it, it's really not like um mm. oh, as complex as I was expecting it to be. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of and it works. A lot of other models out there will be like, oh, you know, you got to do this, and then they'll, they'll do the rust layer, and then you got to do the the mud layer and then this layer and the and yeah, <laughs> yeah. you expect there to be like seven different layers in there at yeah, least yes. right yeah, yeah. and that was actually uh fairly straightforward yeah mm. it was and it just looks gorgeous as yeah. well no, so very, got a lot of talent yeah it inspired me to go and um go on then pick up one of my armor kits again mm. oh, i've got still got that stupid russian rocket that i'm fighting me all the way to the end <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to oh, I'm not that, saying man. anything else I've said enough on that kit <laughs> I need to find somebody who's really good at doing um, good uh, kits no well <laughs> kit is that 
But I need to find somebody who's good on um, drawing 3D stuff so I can perhaps print off the, the problematic parts. <laughs> you well, mean the I, whole model? <laughs> no, well, no, because I've done... Well, yeah, almost, actually, when I think of it now. <laughs> but I've looked around to see who does a uh, early uh, Russian um, rocket. Nobody does in 3D at this point. No 3D files. Not in 70 seconds, scale anyway, so... Anywho, mm. so, um, yeah, well, that's it for us. Um, next week, as I said, we'll be at uh, Model Expo, the Australian Model Expo, and we're uh, really excited about that. And um, can't wait to see. Don't forget to come up and say good day. I will have some stickers with me, so if anybody mm-hmm. wants an OTB sticker, yep. just come up and say good day, and I'll have some in my bag. Um, you guys got any kits you're entering into no. the show? In the show? I haven't done um, anything. I haven't <laughs> I've been uh, abysmal on the bench. You can dust something off then. Just no, I think everything I've dusted off, I've entered it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got my um, my Mazda Cosmo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at the other day. I was like, oh, yeah, I could put that in. Yeah, yeah. There's my, there's my, um, there's my entry in there. Mm-hmm. There's other stuff I wish I could have entered in there, but I'll never get it done in time, I don't think. Yeah, I've got a couple yeah. of rockets I can put in. There you go. And maybe a tank as well. Hmm. Or APC. I don't know. I'll think about it. Yes. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, We'll be back in a fortnight's time. Um, Ian. Adios. Julian. Enjoy the weekend. Oh, it's a long weekend. Well, it's a long weekend for us this weekend. Yes, it is. So, yeah. Yes. Celebrating Chucky's birthday. And next... (laughs) Next weekend's going to be a long weekend for me because I've actually taken a leave. So I'll be yeah, I'm trying to get Friday, uh, Friday off. Friday yeah, off. Friday yeah. off. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to try and get that off. Because don't forget Thursday night we're going to be uh, bumping. Yeah. For the club. Mm-hmm. To do. Yeah. Mm. I'll, you know, I'm actually looking. You know, now that you mentioned uh, that uh, we won't be doing a podcast mm. recording there, yeah, I'll be able to do my classic thing where I can just do laps of the place and just yes rediscover. You know, sort of. Yeah, because there's things you missed the first, oh, second, yeah. third time, yeah. and for, you yeah. know you go around with other people and you take note of things you would have otherwise missed. And mm. oh, I really, really miss doing that. Well, there you go. Next weekend, be there or be square. Australian Model Expo 2023. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back in a fortnight. Until then, have a great week. We hope you enjoyed listening to the show as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Don't forget there's a whole host of other fantastic model podcasts out there. To find out more, go to modelpodcast.com for the full listing of a great host of fantastic other shows that are available for your listening pleasure. My name's Dave. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back in a fortnight.